Thank you. There was this man and his wife, they were having a discussion one day. And the wife was upset. She said, you never spend any time with me. He says, well, you don't like to do the things I like to do. So she said, well, all right, you pick a thing and we'll do it together, and then I'll pick a thing and we'll do it together. He said, well, it's, it's deer hunting season. Hey, Albert, good to see you. <laughs> it's, it's deer hunting season. Uh, why don't we go deer hunting Saturday? And then we'll do something you like to do. So Saturday came and they went deer hunting. And he took her out, put her on a stand. He says, now if you see a deer, you shoot him. And I'm going over to the next stand. And so before he could even get to the stand, he heard pow, pow, pow. He says, goodness, she couldn't have shot something that quickly. Comes back. And on the way back, he hears his wife arguing with this man loudly. It's my deer, it's my deer. So he got a little closer and he heard the guy saying, okay, ma'am, it's your deer. Let me get my saddle off of him. Okay, I, I got you now, you're listening. <laughs> but actually there is something spiritual in that, in that. Not the part about, well, even with the mistake. But, uh, you know, sometimes God will say, well, you never spend any time with me. Well, you don't do the things I like to do, God. I'll, I'll go into meddling now. Anyway. I was reading in Acts 10, you know, Acts 10 starts out with, with Cornelius, uh, he's praying, he's a Gentile, he's a Roman, he's praying, but he's a devout man, the Bible says. So I don't have to tell you what he was, the Bible tells us that he was a devout man, so God says, get some of your men and send them over to this city where Peter is. And Peter, Peter will have a message for you. Well, they're on the way. Peter doesn't know any of this. It says, on the next day, Peter has his vision about, you know, the sheet coming down with all the animals on it. God's preparing Cornelius. God's preparing Peter. The vision comes down. God's preparing me. I'm reading this. And, you know, before when I read it, I would have said, well, yeah, I'd like to see a vision like that. I'd like to be involved in a miracle. But as I'm reading that, I said, God, that's what I want, a relationship with you where you speak and I hear what you're saying. Go bark there for a minute. And guess what the next thought that came to my mind? I thought about a check that I had written. Oh, wait a minute. See, I don't, I don't write many checks anymore. Linda takes care of all the checks. 30 years ago when we got married, you know, Pass the checkbook back and forth. I finally said, here, you just you write the checks. But as far as the church is concerned, I'm authorized to sign a check. I don't have any checks, but if I need one, I'll check with Miss Susan, and she'll give me one, and I'll, I'll write it. And, you know, if I'm out and I'm buying equipment, a lot of times, rather than having a, a check that's signed by her, if I'm there... I've got identification, I can write the check and give it to the man and it's a whole lot easier. Plus, at Christmas and on their birthdays, the church, all of you that tithe, we give them a check for uh, Christmas, we give them a check for their birthday. Well, 
You know, as a, as a form of checks and balances, it would be better if a third party, you know, wrote the check rather than Bob write a check to himself. You know, how would that like look in the audit? Or if Susan writes Bob a check, you know? So, yeah. So at Christmas time, when the fellowship gives them a check, I will sign it, and that will be part of their gift. And on their birthdays, we do the same thing. A lot of times, it will be signed by me, and so, you know, when you audit the books, okay, yeah, that's fine, okay. And I usually write on there, it's a, it's a birthday gift or it's a Christmas gift. Now, sometimes, uh, Pastor Bob and Susan's birthday, a couple of weeks apart, so a lot of times we'll celebrate it on the, on the same day. Well, this year and last year, the way it fell, we just uh, celebrated Bob's and then we celebrated Susan's. Well, I wrote Pastor Bob a check for $250 and it didn't bounce. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I wrote that and everything was great. And so this, this past week, uh, I wrote one for when it, whenever it was, uh, for, uh, it was Wednesday, right? Last Wednesday? Uh, I wrote one for Susan. Now, how did I get from reading this scripture to talking about checks? Here I was, the check that came to my mind was the one that I had written to Susan. And I wrote it out to her, and I put 250. A lot of times, you know, when we write it together, we give them one for 500, and I put both names on it. Well, this time, I had written one for Pastor Bob, and then I wrote one for Susan. So I wrote, wrote her name on there and wrote $250. And then when I wrote out, you know, how you, you put the number in the top, and then on the line you write $250. I had written... $200. And the Lord showed me that. Now, Frank, that's a simple thing. Not to me. Not to me. God cared enough to speak to me and say, he didn't say, you messed up again, Frank. He just showed me the check. $250? $200. And you know, if you take that to the bank, They'll, put on, they'll cash it for whatever's written out here, not whatever that amount is. So I called Miss Susan and I said, did I write $200 on there? Yes, you did. I said, well, I, I, need, to, I need to change that. The reason I know what the amount they'll give you, Mama used to do that. She'd write a check for $25, and then she'd write 20 on the thing, and, well, we can only give you $20. So, no, give me that check back, I'll go and... But see, God cared enough. God cared enough to say, you know, it would have been harder on me if Miss Susan would have called and said, you know, hey, you know, and she'd have been graceful. You know, you, the check says this, and, but God showed me. It's like, it's like last week I was up here and I had put the microphone in my pocket. And when I, when I took it out, I put it on because I was going to speak. And I left my flap inside the pocket. And I'm up here, and I'm talking, and I asked if anybody had anything to share. And Rick raised his hand. <laughs> I said, yeah, your, your flap's inside your pocket. But you know what? That showed me that Rick knows me well enough and cares enough for me to say, hey, Frank, I know you'd be upset if you knew that that was in there. Now, I know some people that say, hey, hey, look at you. Your flap's in your pocket. <laughs> to embarrass me. But Rick, Rick knew me enough. Rick knew me enough to show me grace and say, Frank, take care of your flap. I think God's told me, hey, Frank, <laughs> take care of your flap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in, anyway, I've, I've gone to rambling now, but, but the point is, 
That's what I want Amen. from God. Right. Hey, Frank, the check. You just made a simple mistake and didn't write the right amount on the bottom. Thank you. That pleasure you, don't it? Amen. Now, see, through all of this, I heard God about what he shared. And that is why all of you are sitting there. I wonder before the service is over, you could come up and give a testimony and say, I heard God in the message today. I saw myself in the message. And I would say, was it positive or minus? Mm, minus. We have to learn that God is a good God and he corrects us because he loves us. Amen. Everybody say, he loves me. <laughs> See, the more ground, grounded we get in his love, then we can take correction from a brother or a sister and not get offended and leave the church and then ultimately probably leave God. So that's why we teach here. We want to see myself in the message. Everybody say, I, I want to see, see myself, myself in the message. Yes. All right, that's clear, and that, that's great. That's why we come to church. Why did you go to school? Everybody say, to learn. to learn. You come to church to learn, yeah, to worship God, to fellowship with the saints, to support the work of the ministry. So we need to remember that God is a good God, even sometimes when he spanks you. I learned, I learned a long time ago what David said. David said, King David said, you know, I went astray uh, <clears throat> before I was afflicted. Guess what? I don't go astray anymore. <laughs> I remember when I was a young kid, I went astray one time, and, and, and Dad uh, straightened me out. And for three weeks, I didn't go astray anymore. <laughs> Aren't you glad that we have a God that loves us? And when he corrects us, it doesn't mean he doesn't love us. It means he loves us. Albert, we love you. Good to see you today. Amen. All right, Phil, what you got? Amen. Just, um, I just wanted to share something uh, with you folks, and, and I think maybe in the church, many in the church, uh, maybe like me, you're getting a little discouraged sometimes when you see all that's going on around us, how, let me put it this way, um, the enemy is attacking our religious freedoms, our religious liberties, is attacking God's word is attacking the very foundations of our faith. And it gets me a little upset sometimes. I was reading, I got something in the mail. I just wanted to share it with you. It's pretty quick, but it's, uh, I belong to the Gideons. And uh, they sent out this word that, uh, it was an article that was published. It says, the atheist pressure group urges banning of Bibles placed by the Gideons International in hotel rooms worldwide. Most of you in here probably have been in a hotel room at some point. Uh, you may have been in the hospital at some point and had a Gideon Bible there. If you were in the military, you probably got a, a what we call the PWT, a personal worker's testament, a little pocket Bible. I've got one of those. Um, and in schools, you know, we, we distribute God's word around the world in these different realms. And so now these guys um, are coming and attacking the Gideons for placing Bibles in hotel rooms. And it says, the largest association of atheists and agnostics in the United States has asked the hotel and motel industry to offer Bible-free rooms and, accu <laughs> and accused the Gideons International 
of exploitation. In a letter, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, FFRF, urged the American Hotel and Lodging Association, whose members offered a total of 4.8 million rooms, to offer Bible-free rooms, just as establishments now offer smoke-free rooms. I mean, it's just, it's just getting crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's time that the lodging industry just say no to the Gideons. The Gideons International is exploiting hotels and motels to proselytize a captive audience, it claimed. Gideons has distributed over two billion Bibles and New Testaments, Charisma News reported. It is more than just a number. We are placing Bibles because they lead people to Christ. Behind every number is a face. Behind every face, a story. Behind every story, a priceless soul that will live throughout eternity, said the Gideon International President, Dr. William E. G. Thomas. In his letter, the FFRF said it prefers to add insult to injury, said it prefers that hotels and motels, get this, place Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species in their rooms instead of the Bible. I mean, that just gets my blood going. And um, so I think, you know, just to follow up on what Frank was saying, the Lord is gracious. And, and this morning, Pastor, I was reading through, I read both the Old and the New Testament kind of parallel. And I'm reading, this is Second Chronicles uh, chapter 32. Hezekiah, a good king, his city is surrounded and is being besieged by uh, the king of Assyria and Sennacherib. Sennacherib is laying siege to the city. Now, Hezekiah didn't sit still. He built up the city. He fortified the walls. He fortified the army. He built shields and spears, and they were ready. But Sennacherib's army came against Jerusalem, taunting the people on the wall, saying, who do you think you are? We have conquered nations all over the world. We have brought people to their knees who thought their God was going to protect them. Give up. Don't believe your king Hezekiah, who says your God is going to protect you. Well, he was sorely mistaken. But what encouraged me is this passage right here. It's, it's 2 Chronicles 32 starting with verse 7. Hezekiah is now speaking to his people, and it says, He gave them encouragement, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all of the multitude that is with him. For there are more than with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and fight our battles. And the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. That's an encouragement to all of us. Amen. Thank you, Phil. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Oh, oh yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, you can hold my arms getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a couple things real quick. First of all, um, I've been continuing to get messages about Brian, who has been in the burn unit in Augusta. And he actually sat up on his own today for 20 minutes, which is huge, huge, huge. Um, he's been writing notes to his wife, so they've been able to start communicating. Um, he has actually been able to sit in a chair for a while. He's been through a lot of physical therapy. And um, she's just totally excited right now because they're able to communicate. I mean, all these months she has not been able to even communicate with him. 
but at least now he's able to write notes or in the air he's spelling things out and she's able to help him. Um, so keep him in prayer, keep her in prayer, and this is, he's doing fantastic right now, even though he's still got a long road ahead of him, he's, he's doing much better than he was, so keep them in prayer. Um, also, something that the Lord brought back to me while Frank was up here speaking, and I felt like I needed to go ahead and share this again, there's somebody here who has not seen this who needs to see it, can I unplug this real quick? It's off, right? Okay. This, pretend this goes on forever, this string here, this, not string, but you know what I'm saying, cord, and it goes on forever. You see this microphone here? This represents your life from here to here. That represents eternity, the rest of your life. This is all you're living right now here on earth. But that is eternity. So what are you worried about here? How big is that really? Your 80 years or 100 years you live here? What is that really in the scheme of things? What are you planning for? Are you planning for this? Or are you planning for that? No matter what we go through right here, no matter what we go through right here, it's going to affect that. How are we responding to what happens to us right here? Oh, well, you hurt my feelings. And then we get all bitter, and then we live the rest of eternity wondering why we're not in heaven because we've got anger and murder in our heart towards our brother. We don't forgive here. How's it going to affect us forever? We don't, we don't trust God here. How's that going to affect us forever? Things that happen here in our life, like Pastor Bob has said many times, the decisions we make today affect our tomorrows. Well, we got a lot of tomorrows. Everyone has eternal life, folks. The question is, where are you going to spend yours? Even Satan believes in God. But there's more to it than just believing and getting saved and knowing there's a God. It's having that intimate relationship with him here through this part of our lives. Amen? And that ties hand in hand with the next thing I'm going to share. And then I won't be up here too long today. And I will roll this. Pardon? Oh, yeah. It goes from that pretty wide microphone to a very narrow cord. It keeps getting more narrow as you go down that microphone. Psalms 37. And this is something the Lord's been showing me recently, even though, you know, we read it and we understand it. Psalms 37 has been one I have lived by forever. 37 verse 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires and secret petitions of your heart. How many of you in here as mothers and as fathers have just, sometimes you just spend yourself out there. You're just working. You're just doing this. You're cleaning. You're, oh, it gets exasperating after a while, right? And at some point, we forget how to do verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Roll and repose each care of your load on him. Trust Lean on, rely on, and be confident also in him, and he will bring it to pass. Amen. Verse 6, he will make your uprightness and right standing with God go forth as a light, and your justice as, and right as the shining sun of the noonday. Verse 7, be still and rest in the Lord. Wait for him and patiently lean yourself upon him. Fret not yourself because of him who prospers in his way, 
because of the wicked who brings wickedness, wicked devices to pass. Verse 8. This is the revelation I'm getting ready to share you. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil doing. As, and, and I'm speaking to the women, but I'm also speaking to the men here. How many of us, and you don't have to raise your hand, I'll raise mine, because I know I've been there. You get so busy. You're working. You're still praying. You're still in the word. You're still building the relationship that you need to build with the Lord. But there's something not right. You're tired. You're exasperated. You're frustrated with the children. Actually, you find yourself getting a little angry because things just aren't going exactly the way you want them to go. If you read this again, you find out there's a reason he said cease from anger. Because he knew that if we didn't do what was before that, that's exactly what was going to happen. We would get into this mode where everything's got to go a certain way. We got to get the dishes done. We got to do this. And why aren't you doing this? And we're always telling our spouse what to do. I challenge you, stop telling people what to do and do what you know to do. Because what will happen is if we don't rely on and trust on and lean on him in our relationship with him, we will become angry and we will start lashing out at people around us. It is, it's right here, folks. It's right here. It's beautiful. I have been seeing this, oh, delight yourself in the Lord and I'm going to get what I want, right? We all see that part of the scripture. But let's look at the rest of it. Let's really rely on him. And how do we do that? It's more than just prayer. It's more than just singing songs and worshiping him. It's a lifestyle where everything I speak, everything I do, it is living by the spirit, not by what my mind wants to do, but what my spirit man and God, you're seeing with different eyes. You're not looking with those natural eyes anymore. You're looking with the spiritual eyes. And you see needs when you look at people's eyes. You see the gateway to the soul, and you know what they need. And you pray, and you move, and you go. And, and it's easy. I wrote down, I told a couple of you this. At the beginning of the year, I was so tired. I said, Lord, sabbatical. And in my mind, when I wrote that down in my little day timer, if anyone asked me to do anything during those two weeks, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm actually pretty busy those two weeks. Because I'm going to sit myself down and do nothing. But that's not what God wanted me to do. That's when he started speaking to me about the conference. And it was not a burden. It was beautiful. Everything worked out. Everything was wonderful. Everyone pitched in. It was amazing. Because I leaned on him and I listened to him. Now, I could have said, that's too much work. But it was what he wanted. And so... When we need that rest, it's not about just sitting back and doing nothing. It's about leaning more on him than you are yourself. Amen? In verse 8, it tends only to evil doing. You know what that word evil doing means in the root word? To break, do harm, hurt, or to break down in pieces. Who are we breaking down in pieces? ourselves, other people? Who are we hurting when we get to that point? So I want to encourage you, God has made a plan for us so that we don't have to get to verse 8 and end up affecting ourselves and other people. So everyone, just right now, just where you're sitting, say, Lord, please forgive me for leaning more on myself than you and help me in these future days to know when I've done too much and not relied on you. Help me to draw closer to you. And I thank you for it. And thank you for forgiving me, Lord, for any anger, any anxiety that I have forth, put forth towards anyone else. In Jesus' name, you're clean. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Wow. about another half an hour yet so uh, 
I'm going to just carry this thought uh, along here. You know, God tells us to do things. So we start doing it. But we didn't hear the last little words. But not in your own strength. Amen. See, he tells us to do things. Turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 for me in there. This is very important, and I want you to listen to this. It, it took me years to, to come to this. Thank you. God tells us to do things, and all of us, naturally, we're going to try to do it in our own strength. This is like a mystery. It, it's hard to understand. But you just have to get connected to God. Each day as you stay in the Word and read the Word, you learn something. God tells you something, just like he told Frank. I can give you many examples how God has spoken to me, and it turned out exactly right. But here's what I want to get across to you. Uh, in verse 12, put verse 12 up there. Is that 12? All right, let's read that. Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed my suggestions. Now, Paul is talking here. So now, not only with enthusiasm you would show in my presence, but much more because I am absent. Work out, cultivate, carry out to the goal, and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling. Self-distrust with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchful against temptation, timidly shrinking from whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Christ. And now I'm a nervous wreck. <laughs> when you read that, you say, oh, God, how can I do all those things? But look at the next verse. Amen. Read the next verse. And I put the next verse up there. And make sure you do it in your own strength. What? But not in your own strength. So we all have a tendency. All. That's me, by the way. All. I'm, I'm in the all. We all have a tendency to set out. Well, you know, it's New Year's and I got a new resolution. That must be a new word I'm inventing. A new revelation. I'm going to do better this next year than I did last year. And you turn out to be worse. Because <laughs> now you're really a nervous wreck. Because you're not trusting. And you know when you're not trusting, you get all frustrated. You get all um, anxious. And by the way, all those things bring sickness upon you. So, so many people today, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick. I know you are. You're sick of trying to do it yourself. And that makes you sick. See, there's a rest. Hebrew talks about a rest. There's a rest for God's people. Now, I want you to look at me. I know I'm not 19 and I'm not 25. And I'm not 15 and I'm not 16 and I'm not 70 and I'm not 75 and I'm not 80. I'm 84. Do you think I've learned anything yet? Yes. All right. Now, pay attention to me. Unless you want to go around and, and, and when you get about 50, you've got o uh, oysters. I mean, oysters or whatever you call them. <laughs> <laughs> Took me years to get rid of those oysters. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking right, you know. Now, <clears throat> things that are making us sick is like resentment and bitterness and, and, and over-anxious and anxiety. Uh, the, 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 the drug industry is making millions and billions of dollars trying to calm everybody down. Even the, pre even the president is... <laughs> <clears throat> what are we going to do with Korea? I mean, China's acted up again. They want to take over the sea again. What, what, what are we going to do? You're just going to have to learn to tap into God. I said, you're going to have to learn like I had to learn. I've struggled in my years to finally come to the place that the world blows up. I'll go with it, but I'm going to go happy. <laughs> Come on, church, don't shout me down. All right, now let's read that again. Not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectively at work in you. Amen. 
A lot of Christians are not, they, they just think that God's up on the throne up there. He ain't doing it. No, he lives in you. He's working in you. Everybody say, God's working, God's working. in me. In me. <clears throat> you have to put faith in God that God is working in you. Now, notice what it says. Energizing and creating in you the power and the desire. As long as you've got a desire to do uh, something like, uh, well, I won't mention certain things that people do today, but I used to dip snuff. Anybody in here dip snuff? Anybody in here chew the tobacco? Anybody in here chew bubble gum? I, I had a teacher one time, it was my third grade teacher when I was in uh, Lake City, South Carolina. And uh, back in those days, you know, you already seen the schools back in those days. You know, one teacher taught three grades, third, fourth, fifth grade. We had a wood stove in, in, in the class and we were all in that class and she would dip, she would dip snuff. She says, now when I tell you something, I want every one of you here to hear me and hear me good. And, then, and, and she's about 10 foot from the, from the heater. And I tell you what, she was an expert. It never missed. And then you could hear this. Listen, look what it says. God will change my desire. Now, if you have a desire to do something that's, that's uh, hurting your health, you have a desire to do something that if, you, if that person don't talk to me, I'm going to throw a brick at them. I mean, whatever evil desire you have, God can change that. He can totally, absolutely remove that desire, and he can nail it to the cross, and hallelujah, and set you free, and then give you a desire to love the Lord with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength and that's the only way you're going to love him and you're going to love your neighbor as you love yourself and the only way you're going to be able to do that is God is going to give you that desire God is going to do that work in you hallelujah anybody hearing me in here hey that's good so now your faith must go to God when he tells you to do something you know he's going to tell you to do something you can't do Oh, you might do it for a week or two or three weeks. Externally, you may be perfect, but inside, you want to choke them until they turn purple. <laughs> Come on, don't lie to your pastor. I've been around too long. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah, I don't commit adultery anymore, but everything inside of me wants to commit adultery. I know you got to let God change that desire. So put your faith in the Lord. Lord, you said for me not to do this. But Lord, then you said, on the other hand, you would give me the strength. You go all through the Bible. You know why you're born again? You're born again because God born you again. <laughs> you were running as hard as you could. And the Holy Ghost hounded you down and found you and put that desire into you to say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. <laughs> Yeah, he, he did it, and he caused you to be born again. And Jesus said, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Nicodemus, you're an educated fool. I mean, an educated whatever you are, and you don't know these little simple things. So whatever you're trying to do, take my advice, stop it. And say, Lord... I can do all things through Susan who strengthens me. <laughs> yeah, we don't do it when everybody's looking. When everybody ain't looking, we do it. Then we feel, then we're all condemned up, feel com condemned, and uh, there I go, I failed again. I failed so much. This thing ain't working. I know it ain't working because you're trying to make it work. Trust and obey. 
Have you found that to be true? Well, let me tell you something. You'll just keep getting knocked all around or you'll finally come to your senses and say, I remember the day I give up trying to be a Christian. I literally, I quit. And the Lord, the Lord said, man, Bob, Bob I've been working, trying to get you, you, now let me do it. Have you ever tried to thread a needle? Most of you women have tried to thread a needle. Susan don't see quite as well as she used to, so, and neither do I. But together we do it. <laughs> see, see, what you have to do, you have to put the needle in a vice grips, because your hand is shaking like this. <laughs> and, it, you know, the, the, the needle's way over here, and you're trying to thread it there. <laughs> So you put the needle in a vice grip where it, it, and you set it down. It just, it don't shake. It just, and then you take both hands and, and you thread it. You can thread it, say. Listen, let's finish reading that scripture again. Man, that's powerful. Notice, he, he, he's going to energize and create in you the power and desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. See, that gets back to what Michelle was saying about all the work she did. Believe me, she was over the day and night back there doing all this for the conference. So me was beginning to get a little concerned, but we cast that on the Lord. <sighs> Do you know how I got out of bed this morning? Read my lips. What am I saying? Jesus. I didn't hear you. Jesus. Didn't hear you. Jesus. I believe you got it. Lord, I live and move and have my being because of you. Amen. See, some of you don't understand that because you're not 83. Now, what encourages me is that Susan gets out of bed first. And she knows what her job is to get the coffee pot going. But anyway, getting up is a big chore when you get older. <clears throat> Isn't that right, uh, Willie? <laughs> <laughs> but listen, folks, you know I'm serious when it comes down to trusting the Lord. Some of you, are just, you got burdens on you right now. You just, just it, and the devil just keeps piling it on you. Pile it on you, pile it on you. Sometimes you just got fears, you got anxieties, you got worries. Oh, I've had all of that. Let me tell you something. Turn to uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. How many has ever seen an artesian well? How many's ever seen an artesian well? All right. How many's ever seen a well that you have to pump? Well, basically, most Christians are like that. We, we have to pump it up. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you can't get no water out of that pump until you what? Prom it. So you know, you're priming that thing and a pumping. It is 180 degrees outside, and you're pumping it, and, and and all of a sudden, this guy comes over here, and this water just bubbles out of the ground, just bubbles up out of the ground, and the guy drinks the cool water, and the water just bubbles up, no effort at all. And all the other Christians are over there. <laughs> I, can, I can love the Lord, my God. I know I love you, Lord. Uh, I appreciate you and all that. <laughs> Anybody out there? <laughs> Listen to this. Got it on the board. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes, which is love, joy, gladness, peace, patience, even tempered, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benefit, whatever, faithfulness. You can't produce that. That's the fruit 
of the Holy Spirit. Can you ever see an apple tree? What you doing, apple tree? I'm trying to bear an apple. You don't bear them that way. You abide. You abide in the earth, and the sap comes up through the root system into the uh, into the tree and into the branches. And the natural thing is that it just bears apples, and it can't help from bearing apples because it's abiding in the vine, abiding in the vine. Woo, 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 abiding in the vine. How many gets the principle? Abide in me. You can do nothing outside of me. Listen, I started out in the uh, Christian faith, and I remember one time I came in, and, and I literally fa- fell o- o- in the kitchen floor, and I fell down. I said, Lord, I can't carry it no more. I can't win the world no more. <clears throat> Bob, why do you think we have uh, Billy Graham and uh, Oral Roberts and a few in all the churches? Oh, Lord, you, I thought you wanted me to win the whole world. How many of we start out that way? Albert, we started that way. Listen, whatever the Lord gives you, because, see, you can take too much on you. That's why if you walk in the Spirit, you can rest. Because he will, be, he will see that you will bear fruit. Maybe you're just a sower. Maybe that's your job. It's just a sow. You know, as long as you keep the, the seed in your pocket. Oh, no, no, you've got to sow it. You just sow it. Just sow it. Phil comes along, waters it. But Bob gives the increase. Huh? Huh? God! We'll get him back to God again. God gives the increase. Oh, if I could, if my husband would just love me. He can't. The natural man has a a natural love. It takes a spiritual man to love because the spiritual man has the agape love which comes from God. It ain't his love. He can't love you. You step on his foot, he's going to bite you. Any women say amen in here? (laughs) Not a one? You scared to say anything? Oh, you did? I got one honest one over here. Ain't no need to blame him. I've had women, if I my husband just love me. Honey, he can't love you. See, so, so, so the only thing he can love is himself. That's what we call selfishness. <laughs> selfishness. See, it takes the, the love of God. Because, see, the love of God is strong. No greater love that a man can have than for a man to lay down his life. The agape love will cause you to lay down your life for your loved ones and for people. We must understand it's God that saved me. It's God that sanctified me. It's God that justifies me. It is God that made me righteous. It is God that wrote my name in the book of life. It is God that will resurrect me. It is God that will sustain me. It was God that will see me through this old world. It is God all the way before the foundation of the world. He chose me to be his own. Before the foundation of the world, he chose you to be his own. Oh, I'm telling you, it's God. It's God. It's God, 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 God. Give me five. Oh, it's God, 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 five. God, five, five. Let's see, five, five is 15, 20. $20. Is that 20? (laughs) Folks, it's God. So, Push all your stuff aside. Just get free right now. Just say, thank you, Lord. Just 
Don't carry it around no more. Don't let the devil put it on you no more. Just let it go. Let me tell you, the world was running before you got here and it's going to run after you go. So why try to carry it? God never intended you to carry it. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. It's God. It's God. It is God. Amen. It's God, children. It's God. And he'll, so now on, you just trust the Lord that he's going to do the work in you. I remember one time, and I'll close on this one. Over the years, we would have uh, young girls come into our home. They got pregnant, and their parents kicked them out of the house. So we, Susan B. would take them in and stay long enough where we could teach them and everything. I remember this one woman. She, she didn't know how to be a housewife. She didn't know how to clean a house. And uh, so, so Susan began to teach her. And the next day, she left. I don't want to be a housewife. You mean I got to do the dishes? You mean I got to cook dinner? Wow. Nobody never told me that. So she left. Of course, she's dead now. She died many years ago. People don't know how to walk in the spirit. People don't know how to drive a car until you teach them. How many in here just knew how to drive a car? Did somebody teach you? Somebody te People had to be taught. Now, we're talking about spiritual things here. How do you let it go? You know, you're carrying this burden. You're, you're carrying this anxiety. How do you let it go? <clears throat> That's where you've got to tap into God. And let God begin to flow in you like that artesian well. But see, we're habit creatures. You've been doing something so long that you just naturally do it. Now catch this. Remember the story I gave about uh, Tammy leaving her dog at our house for 10 days. But we told Cal, that was the dog's name, Cal, from California. Cal, you stay right here. Uh, in this little hallway, okay? And don't go in the rest of the house. Miss Susan don't like that, okay? And Cal said. <laughs> so every time I'd come into the door, I'd step over Cal. For, for 10 days, I learned to step over Cal. Step over Cal. Well, anyway, Tammy comes home. Steve comes home. They take the dog back home. But I come in the house, and I'm stepping over Cal. <laughs> but Cal ain't there. See, the fears that some of you have, it's not really there. You, you've been so used to just getting, stepping over in the fear. Because, see, God ain't give you no spirit of fear. But of power, love, and a sound mind. But in your mind, you think cow is still there. And you're going around like this when you start walking. Why does that guy walk like that? He's stepping over cow. And cow ain't there. One more. How many remembers the bear? It had this bear, and this cage was 20 foot long, 20 foot long. For 20 years, that bear walked up and down that cage. 20 years. And one day, they said, you know, I'm sick and tired of that, that bear walking like that. Uh, why don't we get, put him out in the woods and let him go free? Yeah, good idea. So they get this big crane. They pick this big cage up, put it on this truck, go out into the high mountains and everything, opens the door, and the bear goes back and forth. See, see the, the, the door's open for freedom. You see, Christ opened the door for liberty and salvation and, and freedom, but, but you still have that old complex walking up and down. This is your secure blanket now. Like some folks come to church, you can't get some of you folks out of those chairs. You, you, you glue to those chairs. It is sort of scary to get up here, isn't it? <laughs> Not for her. I'm a miracle. You're looking at a miracle here. Yeah, I ain't getting up there. 
I remember we had a play one time in school. They, want, they wanted me to be a grape. This grape uh, did go to school that day. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, so they take a flame and they, they, and they run the bear out of the cage. And they say, man, he's free. And the bear went 20 foot this way. Cage is on the truck. Truck's going and the bear's going back and forth. There's the battle in your mind. You still think you're all bound up. And God says, no, I've come to set you free. He that has a son is free. You got to say, I'm free. I'm not going to let this, the, 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 these, these emotions that, that have been trained to act a certain way. I, I am not going to let these feelings dominate and control me no more. I am not going to be a scared to go up there and give a testimony. I'm not going to be a scared to share the gospel with people outside. I refuse that. But a lot of church members are not in the cage. God set them free. And I'm not mocking nobody because I was there. But I found that scripture. Not in your own strength, Bob. I used to go around. We used to have visitation in the Baptist church. And I'd go around the block at least five times. I said, well, maybe they'll go to sleep. <laughs> so I'd go up to the door. Oh, they're not home. <laughs> Visited, not home. Anybody out there got to testify? Come on, don't lie to me, church. Huh? Any, huh? Come on. Huh? 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 Come on. Raise your hand. Come on. Come on now. Come on. Now. Yeah, don't lie to me. Uh-huh. Okay. Listen, you have got to realize God has done a work, and he's continuously working in us, making us willing to do his good pleasure. Amen. But not by our own strength, but by the strength of the Lord. Then you can take care of a conference. It'll be sheer pleasure for you. Sheer pleasure. I mean, it's sheer pleasure for me to kiss my wife. Amen. No strain at all. It's sheer pleasure for her to scratch my back. <laughs> you don't scratch each other's back? What, what, what do y'all do? <laughs> little bit over there darling <laughs> come on church you know God loves you walk out of this place I got the victory everybody say I got the victory <laughs> devil you're a liar amen praise God father I pray right now if anybody needs prayer let them come up and we'll pray for them anybody that's here never trusted Christ as their personal savior this is the moment that God is calling them forth to surrender their life to Christ and we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. And give us a little song there, up there. Hallelujah. What you got, babe? Friday night. Friday night, we have a movie here and a dinner here. Come at 6.30. And we have, we have uh, I think we got uh, possum stew and grits. <laughs> and for those that like... Uh, and for, and for those that like snails, we'll try to snail up a few for you. <laughs> okay, if you need to come, let's hear the music. Stand to your feet, turn to somebody and say, I'm breathing God. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs>